Well, the powers that be tell me that I only have 30 minutes, a strict limit of 30 minutes, and uh, those who are here from my own congregation are probably laughing inside because they know after 30 minutes I'm just getting warmed up. Well, uh, with that in mind, uh, there's a great Puritan by the name of John Flavel, and he once said that the best way to preach a crucified Christ is in a crucified manner. So I will try to crucify my own style uh, to accommodate myself to the masses this afternoon. Well, uh, we do live in a time of Christless Christianity, and uh, as this conference is seeking to diagnose that problem as well as to prescribe a cure for it, uh, I believe very strongly that the Reformed Christian faith is that cure to the ills of our time. And uh, I hope that this little book, which I will give you a brief intro to, uh, plays a small part uh, in that uh, cure. Let me say just a thing or two about uh, Reformed Church, what it's not and what the book is not uh, to be. Uh, most people visit a Reformed Church for the first time and uh, it, it is totally different. Uh, I didn't grow up in a Reformed Church, so I know the feeling. We look like freaks. We uh, are the frozen chosen. We are, we're cold, we're boring, we're lifeless, uh, oftentimes not very hospitable, uh, not very friendly. We don't smile that much. Maybe uh, if you visited a Reformed church at one point, uh, you might have heard something uh, along the lines of this. Uh, you walk into church and I greet you, say, hello, my name is Danny Hyde, welcome to the Oceanside URC, and uh, maybe the first question you were asked was, credo or pedo? Maybe the first question or maybe the, one of the, in the midst of a conversation you were asked, pre, post, or ah? And the person gave you a, you gave them a, the person a puzzled look, and uh, somebody might have gone on to say, well, let me just make it a little more simple to you. Are you a super lapsarian or are you infralapsarian? And that was the end of that. <laughs> uh, Michael Horton was one of my, one of my uh, professors in seminary. I won't tell you how bad he was in his first couple of years, but he was one of my professors in seminary, and he described that sort of attitude to a visitor to a Reformed church as the cage phase. Have you heard that slogan before, the cage phase? The cage phase is basically the guy or the girl, mostly the guy, young guy uh, with spiky hair and a goatee who becomes reformed and uh, is so excited about it that you have to put him in a cage for a year just to calm him down and to tame him a little bit. Well, the book is not trying to be uh, that kind of a guy, that kind of a person. Uh, it's not meant to be that cage phase but uh, to welcome unbelievers and uh, disillusioned, dissatisfied evangelicals, those who are searching for the truth uh, in a very understandable uh, as well as a very uh, hospitable way. Well, I want, to do, I want to think a little bit about that, uh, give you some of the, the contours, the background of this little book uh, by thinking about the idea of assurance. And I'll come back to why I mentioned uh, assurance in just a moment. It was the great 17th century Catholic apologist, polemicist, Robert Bellarmine, who said that the greatest heresy of the Protestant religion was the assurance of salvation. He said that because, of course, in the medieval church and in the Reformation, the people were amidst a Christendom sort of society. Everyone lived within and under the umbrella of the church and were looking for some assurance that the Creator actually spoke and speaks to the creature. And uh, the pious Catholic looking for assurance that he would not spend eternity in the flames of hell. The Protestants, of course, gave assurance in the midst of that, the assurance that we can know that we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, body, soul, life, and in death. Well, we live in a time different than that, of course. We don't, we don't live under a Christendom model. We don't have a church in every corner with a great spire where everyone's a member of the local parish congregation. But we do live in a time that uh, is one in which there is great excitement about the Christian faith, the Reformed faith. Dr. Jones was also one of my professors, and uh, he always thoroughly uh, disillusions and depresses when he gives a lecture. It is a very uh, difficult time in which we live. But uh, you might have seen the Time Magazine article last year, the 10 ideas that are changing the world, and number three was uh, Calvinism. We live in a time in which there are many who are seeking, who are searching, who are looking for assurance. 
looking for answers, and that answer is found in the Reformed faith. Uh, We do live in a post-everything sort of culture. Everyone seems to be, in our time and place, different than the medieval and the Reformation period where uh, Bellarmine did say that uh, assurance was the height of uh, the Protestant heresy. We don't live in that sort of a time of assurance, but people are looking for assurance not for their own particular personal angst necessarily, but really larger questions of how can we know anything is true? How can we find anything with roots and stability? People are looking for community and looking for assurance of that. Uh, One illustration of that is uh, uh, an article that was recently written by a a theologian at Creighton University, Russell Reno, and he uh, just gave a brief little explanation of the phenomenon of tattoos. He said, uh, tattoos used to be, of course, the great symbol of rebellion and independence, but that uh, tattoos nowadays have become the opposite of that. Really, it's a symbol of belonging, belonging to something bigger than oneself and larger uh, than my own particular personality. We can give people the Reformation. We can say to people, as the great hymn writer said, I was once lost, but am now found, was blind, but now see. Well, what is this little book all about? Well, first of all, just speaking of that idea of assurance, the Reformed faith seeks to give the assurance of our history. Uh, It was Lewis, C.S. Lewis, who described us as a chronologically arrogant people. Uh, His time, of course, he said that uh, in the uh, mid-20th century. It can't be any truer than today. Uh, We're slaves to sound bites. We're slaves to the tyranny of news cycles which so sadly have a cycle of a girl who's gone missing and only to be trumped by uh, the next celebrity and his or her faux pas. We are uh, in it for the minute and we are here for the now and what have you done for me lately? The Reformed faith, though, is a faith that is rooted in history, that is rooted in the Old and the New Testaments, the people of God, rooted with the Catholic Christians of the first few centuries, the Reformation and that great revival of religion in the 16th century. So this little book seeks to give a sense of that, that uh, as I open up, to give something of the history of our churches, our roots, our foundation, the basis of why we exist and upon what we stand. We can say very confidently as believers in the Reformation that we have roots that are dug down very deep. We call upon family and friends and neighbors who are looking for something greater than themselves to find it in Christ, the gospel, and in the church. Well, secondly, the Reformed faith seeks to give, and this little book seeks to give, the assurance of our theology. Not just history for history's sake, but the substance of what is found in that great movement of history in the Reformation. Uh, Tomorrow, I want you to think, for those of you who are in Reformed churches or those of you who are in churches that are becoming maybe more and more Reformed in its theology, stop and think about the person who walks into the doors of wherever you might meet, and especially anyone who might be there for the first time. Put yourself in their shoes. What are they going to hear today? What are they going to see? How is it going to be different? What are they going to experience that may not be anything close to what they're used to? How can we communicate this great faith, this pearl of great price, uh, to those who are there right in front of us? Uh, No doubt many of us have the same and uh, similar story to my own. Uh, A person who once walked into a Reformed church without a clue I was baptized Roman Catholic. I was uh, in Sunday school in Calvary Chapel. I was converted in the Four Square Church. I was educated in the Assemblies of God. I used pastor in a non-denominational charismatic church. I wasn't Lutheran or Episcopal. I think I was everything else. But no doubt, many of our stories uh, have something of that. Everything other than reformed. And we've come to embrace these things, and those people who are coming need to hear that. You don't need to go in a cage. You need to be yourself, and you need to be inviting. Well, the assurance of our theology really is bound up, of course, in the gospel of justification, sola fide. 
And I can just, my, my own story to say that as I was languishing as a youth pastor and as a student in college in a Pentecostal environment, uh, seeing the same people come down to the altar in chapel week upon week upon week, my, my teammates on my basketball team in college, uh, none of them lived anything close to a Christian life. It was finally they were freed from the shackles of parents. All of this drew, drove me to find and to seek something other than what I was used to. And God's amazing providence. I had a Pentecostal minister who was a professor of mine who started to hand me books by C.H. Spurgeon, uh, who gave me books by Luther and Calvin, and pointed me to uh, Westminster Seminary to find uh, what I was looking for. People are looking for what we have, and, that what, and what we do have, and in terms of our theology, is the gospel, justification. See, our assurance doesn't come as uh, my own experience might t- that does testify and yours might testify. We can't find our assurance in the emotions of ourselves and the churches in which we may have been in. I certainly didn't find it in the emotionalism of Pentecostalism or in the works righteousness of my mother's faith in the Roman Catholic Church. I didn't find it in my intellectual seeking and as I searched other religions and attended mosques and Buddhist temples. Jewish synagogues, uh, and even nothing at all. But the assurance came in these wonderful words. Maybe you've heard them as well. What is justification? Justification is an act of God's free grace unto sinners, in which he pardoneth all our sins, accepteth and accounteth their persons righteous in his sight, not for anything wrought in them or done by them, but only for the perfect obedience and full satisfaction of Christ by God imputed to them and received by faith alone. The Westminster Larger Catechism, Q&A 70. I can remember like it was yesterday, the professor that I had was leading me towards the Reformation, wrote those words upon the whiteboard in class one day. I'd never heard of a catechism, never heard of Westminster, never really thought much about justification. I saw it in my King James Bible, but never really put two and two together. As he wrote those words there, I found what I was looking for, assurance. God himself imputes his own son's righteous merit to me, a worthy, unworthy, poor, lifeless sinner. The middle of this little book seeks to give something of that passion for the gospel, that wonderful assurance that the gospel alone can bring. Well, a person walks into a Reformed church or a church that is a Reformational type of church, what are they going to see when they walk into those doors? Well, for sure, they're not going to see smells and bells of Rome. They're not going to see all the emotionalism of uh, other churches that we might be so familiar with. But they're going to see something completely different, but something that is wonderful. The assurance of what we find in Reformed worship, or what we describe as our liturgy, in which God speaks to us through his word as the minister calls the people of God into his presence. The people of God respond in singing. God speaks in his law. We confess our sins. God speaks in a declaration of pardon, an absolution, and we respond in confession of our faith of the Apostles' Creed as an example. God speaks in the word. We sing. God speaks in the sacraments in a visible way. We give ourselves in our offerings and in our fellowship to him. It seems lifeless, it seems cold, it seems boring. But we find in that liturgy and that worship the practical assurance that God himself meets with sinners, that he's lowered himself, stooped himself into our shoes, into our level, to meet and to greet and to fellowship with us. I don't think I've ever told Mike Horton this, if he's hearing this right now, but uh, his congregation was the first Reformed church I ever walked into. I had a Sunday off from teaching my youth group and uh, traveled to, uh, as they met then, in Placentia, California. And I walked into a church and I never had, in my entire life, held a hymnal. As the minister, Dr. Riddlebarger, announced the, the hymn, we opened it up. Flipped around, I think I had the book upside down maybe. Never read a musical note my entire life. Didn't know when to stand and when to sit, when to do this or when to do that. 
But what it was was heaven. It was heaven on earth. Not because of the excitement or the buzz or the personality, but because of the Word of God. I'd never sat in a service where the Word was read at length. And the sermon was a lengthy exposition of that Word. I never sang psalms and hymns that focused upon the Word, God and His glory in Christ. Received the sacrament of the Lord's Supper in a very simple way. Simply gave our offerings and fellowshiped and greeted each other in the Lord. Reformed worship is a strange, strange world, but yet it's a world in which we find a meeting with our most amazing and gracious triune God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it's, a, it's an idea that's not thought of much these days, worship and the means of grace, as we call them, preaching and the Lord's Supper and baptism. But these earthly means of paper and ink and words and ears and tangible things like water, bread, and wine that God himself uses through which to communicate his grace. Well, Reformed churches also uh, seek to give not merely an assurance of our history and our roots, uh, not only our theology and our assurance for our conscience uh, seeking in our liturgy, our worship in terms of how we experience God, but also gives us an assurance of our piety, our Christian life, our reverent response to God and His grace. Maybe you've walked into a Christian bookstore uh, lately, and uh, no doubt you've seen the so-called Christian doctrine section was about a half of a shelf. What are the rest of the shelves filled with? Christian living, right? And what does that Christian living consist of? Well, there are books on Christian dieting. There are women's issues, and there are men's issues, and teen issues, and uh, books on how to get over the issues that you have, and then how to get over those issues, and to live a triumphant here and now life. Well, the Reformed faith is, uh, sorry to burst any bubbles or any grand ideas or dreams, the Reformed faith uh, doesn't offer that. Uh, Dr. Godfrey, one of my uh, professors at seminary, one of my colleagues in the ministry, says uh, to us often that a good reformed Christian life is to feel a sense of guilt all the time. And a good reformed sermon should make you leave the sanctuary feeling just a little bit guilty. Well, why is that? Well, it's because the Christian life is hard. The Christian life is difficult. It's filled with trials and temptations and that besetting sin, the body of death that clings to us with its claws in our backs. But you see, what the, what the reformers did in their creeds, their catechisms, their confessions was not only to focus on a revival of the gospel, speaking of my own church's catechism, the Heidelberg Catechism, most of the material deals with the Christian life. The third section of our catechism, there's guilt, there's grace, there's gratitude. Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer, how we are to thankfully give ourselves to God for His amazing grace. The Reformed faith is not merely a religion of head knowledge. It's not merely that we show up on Sunday morning that we plug in our USB and we have a download of information. As one of my mentors, Joel Beakey, says, the Reformed faith is a religion of head and heart and hands. It's a life that is wonderfully described by the two grand and opening questions of the two great Reformation catechisms, the Heidelberg Catechism, what is your only comfort in life and in death? That I, with body and soul, life and in death, am not my own, but belong to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. I belong to Him. And as Paul would say in Romans 6, we belong to Him as bond slaves, servants of God, giving ourselves to Him unto obedience. The Westminster Shorter Catechism, of course, even in a much more shorter way, says, what is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. We exist as reformed believers. We believe so strongly. We exist as clay. God is the one who molds us for His own good pleasure. And people walk into a reformed church, they feel beat down. They do feel depressed, defeated, 
ashamed of their sins. We get to say to them, and I hope this little book says this to them, we get to say to them that God makes dead people alive. And he raises us up from the ash heap of sin. He puts our feet upon a rock from the miry clay and he gives us his spirit that we might live with joy and gratitude, knowing our sins, but yet knowing the wonder of grace. The faith of our fathers is one of roots and stability and history. The great Puritan William Perkins described when he, was, he once wrote a treatise describing what was the Reformation all about, and he described himself as a Reformed Catholic. That's what we are. We, our faith is the Catholic faith. Our faith is the Christian faith, he said. Calvin's own liturgy was called the form and manner of prayer according to the custom of the ancient church. Rome says we've had the mass for 2,000 years and the reformers, tongue in cheek with a little snide remark, upon, a snide look on their face said, we've had the Psalms for 3,000 years. We've been singing these songs for 3,000 years. Our forefathers in Israel sang them. The early church sang them. We sing them. We have roots. We have an assurance of salvation, assurance of doctrine, of theology, of grace, of justification. An assurance that we find in our worship, in our liturgy, as we lift our souls to God alone and in our lives as we give ourselves as that piece of clay for God to mold. And so I pray as we go our separate ways, this little book will be a small part of equipping uh, many believers to communicate the great truth of that wonderful hymn to believers, unbelievers, pilgrims, outcasts, strangers, and aliens who walk through our church's doors. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. Amen.